Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. I'm back for another YouTube comments knowledge bomb. This is the type of video where I answer your questions from the YouTube comments. Real quick before we get started, if you're about to treat your studio, if you're in the process of treating your home studio, I don't want you to do that without first downloading my home studio treatment framework, which you can get for free at the link in the description. These are my five steps to systematically treating your studio and getting it to translate. This is a kind of a framework, a top level view of all the steps that you need to take to successfully treat your studio. This is how I approach treating studios. It's all in there. How to set up your desk, your speakers, how to work with pores absorption, when to think about resonance absorption, when and how to bring in measurements, speaker decoupling, subwoofers. It's all in there, but in the right order so you don't turn in circles while you're treating your studio. So if you're in the process of treating your studio and you want to figure out what the next step is to focus on, make sure you download my home studio treatment framework at the link in the description. With that, let's jump into the first question. This one is by Guy and it's on a video called Subwoofers. Can you move low end nulls out of the sweet spot? And Guy asks, what about placing the subwoofer in a near field position? Wouldn't that eliminate most of the room effect since the listening position will experience direct sound before it is affected by the room? Yeah, it's an interesting idea, but the short answer is no, unfortunately not. And the problem is obviously that there is no near field in that frequency range where the subwoofer works. Yeah, the near field is defined by being inside the critical distance and the critical distance is itself defined as the spot where the energy coming from your speakers and the diffuse reverb field in your room are at the same level of course in these sub frequencies there is no diffuse reverb field it's all dominated by these standing waves so unfortunately there is no critical distance there is no near field and so you can't really position a subwoofer in the near field, at least in a typical home studio. If your room gets big enough so that that area, that frequency range where the subwoofer plays isn't dominated by standing waves, then technically you could do that. But we're talking about very, very large spaces here, performance spaces, uh, large concert halls, that sort of thing, right? So yeah, unfortunately this isn't really possible. Moving on to the next question. This is by Paul K on a video called New Studio, Do I Need a Carpet? And he asks, how about a tile floor? Is tile a good start? We have a house in Spain. I would like to know how to best deal with such a solid hard floor. Please, could you advise? Thanks. Yeah, a tiled floor, in my opinion, isn't all that big of a problem. Um, a wood floor is kind of ideal, but uh, in my view, any type of reflective floor is probably better than a carpet simply because you don't have to deal with any unwanted absorption from a floor like that. Yeah, sure. It's going to be, it's, it's, it is, it is very, very hard. So the reflections coming off of that and typically the floor reflection is going to be kind of very distinct, very, uh, yeah, precise, I guess, if you will. Um, but, uh, I think you could just leave it. Yeah. I don't think you need to do anything. If you have a tile floor, go with it. If you want to put a very thin carpet on top, just to make it more comfortable to kind of be on, that's fine, but don't see it as part of the treatment of the room or even try to avoid using a carpet that absorbs too much high end. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, you're good to go. So good question. Here's one by Irene. Use your ears. If you know what you're looking for, <laughs> it's called Lohan. 14th of September, 2022. Uh, in that case, I use my eyes. Yep, good point. Um, yep, you're right. Use your ears if you know what you're looking for. Love it. Moving on. This one is by Drum Shack on a video called Home Studio Soundproofing, Three, mis uh, three Big Mistakes to Avoid to Reduce Noise. And Drum Shack asks, so my question, does sound absorption have any effect or benefit to soundproofing at all? So I'm not entirely sure if I mentioned that in the video, I probably did, hopefully I should have at least, but to answer the question, it does not affect soundproofing or isolation noise transmission. Yeah. You really want to think about isolation and room acoustics as 
separate disciplines, the techniques involved are completely different. And so just because you soundproof or isolate a room properly does not mean you have good acoustics or the other way around, right? So basically don't think of sound absorption that you put into the room as having any positive effect on soundproofing. Good question. So here's one by Connor McKay. It's on the first video in a series on subwoofers called which sub should you get that works best with your speakers? And Connor asks, so would it be better overall to buy a better subwoofer, even though it wasn't specifically designed for your speakers or to take a hit when it comes to the quality of the subwoofer itself to make sure it's matched, so to speak, with your monitors? Yeah, good question. Um, I would definitely uh, lean on a worse quality subwoofer, but that you correctly align with your speakers because the, um, the misalignment, especially if you get it really wrong, is going to have a detrimental effect on the frequency response in that area, in that crossover region. And the problem isn't even just that it's it's bad, but it actually is going to change frequency as you move, right? So there's a kind of a um, a comb filter effect, if you will, um, in the sense that that cancellation frequency moves as you move your head and the distance between you and your speaker and your sub changes. So there's a bit of kind of unpredictability in that, um, which makes things even worse, right? So even if the subwoofer doesn't sound as good, but it is correctly aligned with your speakers, you'll still get a, uh, a solid, a functional frequency response to work with, right? So that's what I would definitely do. Good question. Here's one by Zootook <laughs> on one of my latest videos, egg cartons are bad for acoustics, but why exactly? And he asks, yet another great video. To put the final nail in the carton coffin, would it be to have a bare room, measure it, and then cover all the walls and seating with egg cartons and compare the measurements? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that would be the final nail in the coffin. Um, I'll leave that up to you, all right? I'm not really in the, I'm not really up for spending months collecting egg cartons and then finding an empty room and doing that test is gonna be pretty unsatisfying to do. So um, go for it and uh, let me know what you find. I'd be very curious to see what you actually find. So yeah, good one. And here's another one by the noises I make on the same video on egg cartons. And he says, what if you left the eggs in the carton? They would be much more effective. They would be much more reflective. Mixing different bird species, ostrich, turkey, finch would also give a much wider range of frequencies. Feathers could be added for absorption. Ostrich nests are also useful for frequencies in the lower mid range. Great. Seems like you really put uh, put some research behind this. Um, excellent. I'd uh, I'd like to see that as well. That's pretty good. Um, ostrich nests are useful for frequencies in the lower mid range. Those, those big nests, they really break up those frequencies really, really well. Thanks for that, the noises I make. And yeah, I guess I'll leave it on that note. Thanks for watching. As always, let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you soon.